everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be located. My name is Christy Edwards. I'm the head of policy programs and legal at Geneva Call, and it's an honor to be with you all today. Uh, so as I'm hoping you're all in the right session, we'll be talking about access negotiations with armed groups for protection. And as I'm sure many of you in this room are aware, um, millions of people that live in areas under the control or influence of armed groups are often in dire need of not only life-saving assistance, but also protection. And without quality access for protection, their lives, their dignity, livelihoods, and rights can be endangered. So today, I have several panelists with me who are going to explore how they conceptualize and design access negotiations with armed groups to make sure that specific protection risks faced by civilian populations are addressed. And so we're gonna be looking at a number of different issues and questions today, particularly around different approaches to access negotiations, uh, the complexity of working in a complex, multi-layered and fast developing operational context, the linkages between improved access to essential services for civilian populations and increased protections, and finally, how the role played by local communities and CSOs can be really important in uh, negotiating access. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to our panelists for today. Uh, we're first joined by my colleagues Atif Hamid, who is the head of mission in Iraq for Geneva Call, as well as Pishkafti Shokri, who is our project coordinator based in Nineveh, Iraq. We're also joined by Musa, Awar uh, Musa Agwarizen, and I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name, um, who is the program coordinator in Burkina Faso, also for Geneva Call. Next, we have Aaron Hutchison, who is the country director in Yemen for the NRC. And finally, Samuel Carpenter, who is the team leader for protection and inclusion for the FCDO with the UK government. So welcome everyone. I'm excited to start this conversation today. And um, I'd like to actually start, Atif, with you. If you could share with us your experience from Iraq on the engagement of armed groups in order to gain access. And what are the different approaches to access negotiations with armed groups for protection purposes? And are there any differences depending on whether the focus is on assistance or protection? Thanks, Christine. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> well, uh, in the context of Iraq, uh, I'm going to share some of the perspectives based on our learning. But at the same time, I also invited my colleague, uh, Pishkafti, to also delve with some examples. In the context of Iraq, uh, although the situation in Iraq has improved uh, as compared to the last few years, uh, but still uh, there are a lot of uh, protection-related pr pr protection issues and concerns which are quite uh, prevalent as uh, still Iraq has more than 1.1 million IDPs who are unable to go back to their uh, areas of region due to various uh, security issues, livelihood issues, or housing issues. But uh, I would say that uh, most importantly, the security issues, uh, because Iraq has uh, a number of uh, armed groups who are not only operating at the national level, but also at the local and governorate level. And there are some proxies who are also located in different areas. And uh, when I say these groups, these groups are quite influential in the territories that they control. And uh, they, they need to be a lot of coordination and communication in advance uh, with these uh, elements who are controlling these territories. In the context of this background, as Geneva Call has been here for the last six years, although the situation is better, but uh, uh, we are focusing more on uh, humanitarian engagement, which is basically comprised of uh, international uh, humanitarian law and international human rights law. Uh, within that framework, uh, we have uh, developed a number of uh, uh, materials, training and materials that are uh, leading towards policy level engagement with these groups. Uh, so, uh, as, as, a, as a startup, you know, like uh, we reached out to the leadership of all these different groups, not only at the top level, but uh, at the same time to all of their commanders uh, at the ground level and uh, offered them a number of trainings <clears throat> at policy level so that the groups fully comply with these protocols. 
While working with these groups, uh, we also identified a number of focal points within these forces who can be our uh, lead to do all this coordination and communication. And, uh, and these uh, focal points we have trained effectively so that uh, they can be the mediums to whom we can communicate in case of access negotiations. Uh, so in that respect, we also build the capacities of local NGOs to engage armed groups and uh, facilitated a number of uh, <clears throat> access negotiations on conducting assessments in governorates on return issues, opening up checkpoints, relief access to camps, bringing armed groups, uh, armed actors to negotiation tables to facilitate the return of the IDPs. So I have my colleague Pishkafti, who will give a number of examples, then I get back uh, to delve more light onto it. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Adif, uh, for this intervention. Of course, uh, just like uh, Adif said, um, um, the Geneva call. In Geneva call, we have been uh, dealing with the issues related to access, uh, access and accessibility, uh, both on the side of the populations and on the side of humanitarian community as well in Iraq. Uh, we have um, over these past few years self engagement with the armed groups and uh, international community. Let's say humanitarian community. Um, there were some issues actually uh, facing uh, both the local populations under the control of, you know, I would say in the areas under the control of armed actors and also uh, in other locations in, in their vicinity. Um, so um, we facilitated access for one of the, I would say, key humanitarian actors in, in, in the context of Iraq. Uh, because they did not have, um, you know, I would say, uh, um, access to the leadership of the armed actors in, in one of the locations, I would say, namely in Diyala. And they couldn't uh, conduct, you know, assessments for return and uh, especially the IDPs who were displaced in 2014. So uh, we actually uh, reached out to the leadership of the armed groups in that area and uh, we managed to uh, bring uh, some, I would say, humanitarian aids and relief to the area through that uh, international agency. And uh, not only in Diyala, also in Mosul, Nineveh, there were some access issues facing uh, international uh, agencies and also local NGOs, uh, because, you know, when they were moving into the camps where the IDPs were located, uh, there was a lot of um, harassment, I would say, or I would say, uh, by 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 the staff of the checkpoints on the way, they were disturbing actually the the staff of these local NGOs and the international agencies. So in Geneva call, we actually learned of this issue and uh, we negotiated with armed actors on the ground in the field. Uh, in the first place, it was not easy to reach the leadership, but the, gradually we managed to reach the leadership through Baghdad, of course, not only through the field contacts. Um, and then uh, we managed to uh, bring the armed groups uh, together with the international agencies that had trouble of access to the um, you know, IDP camps in the southern part of Mosul, uh, where a lot of IDPs actually were located. And uh, thankfully, at the end, the uh, relief and humanitarian aids were uh, finally allowed to be delivered to the uh, dwellers of these IDP camps. Uh, most importantly, in Sinjarb, um, there was a time actually when um, one of the key armed doctors controlling the area asked all the international humanitarian community to leave the town, and uh, so the so um, you know the city is already devastated, and the impacts of war and conflict is very much still alive in the city, um, but. Um, only one day later, because we had a training with them a few days uh, before this happened. So we reached out to the leadership of the armed group that didn't allow the international community, uh, humanitarian uh, community to, to operate in Sinjar. And after some negotiations, we managed to uh, resume the humanitarian action in the city of Sinjar. And it was something very impactful and uh, good that we had this response from the armed actors as well. Um, and now we are in the process of actually doing some um, assessment in areas uh, uh, in in the in the province of Salatin, uh, where um, after you know after training and organizing a number of uh, workshops with the armed groups in in Salatin, 
they told us they are ready now to uh, talk to us and to the organizations working in the field to do assessment and they're ready to help uh, facilitate the return of IDPs to their areas. Uh, of course, um, I wouldn't say it's always easy to uh, make access, I would say, uh, facilitate it. Uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, energy at the same time because uh, it's not only the field, uh, I would say, commanders who have the power of decision making. It is. It goes through a lot of filtration and that's why we keep chasing and we keep running and we keep holding the dialogue with all these actors. Um, in other places and locations, we also had... Um, implemented a community-based protection through which uh, we have been able to bring um, all the community leaders, IDP leaders, returnees, media outlets, and all others uh, together with the armed actors. And they began to uh, hold discussions on how to actually make uh, return uh, more conducive and provide facilitations for the people to return. That was also uh, part of the community project we actually conducted in one of the locations. Um, uh, this is in nutshell um, about uh, the, I would say, interventions uh, we and Geneva Call are doing uh, uh, with uh, different armed actors across the country. And thank you. Yeah, and just to uh, sum it up, thanks, Pishkapti, that uh, in terms of these engagements or interventions, it's uh, very important in the process that uh, not only to uh, have continuous engagement uh, with the leadership of the armed groups, but also uh, having regular contacts with their localized commanders on the ground. Uh, what happens in these situations that there's a lot of uh, movements, uh, sometimes armed groups in one territory, sometimes there are new commanders come into place. So you, you need to have uh, uh, regular updating at all the levels and to ensure that uh, your level of, level of trust and confidence is in place. This is very important. Simultaneously, uh, it's also critical that uh, to have access negotiations to build uh, effective uh, relations and have confidence with the tribal leaders, as well as uh, local civil society and local authorities. Because you cannot have just, you know, isolated uh, negotiation with an armed group. You need to bring in all these relevant actors and players on the table. That's how like, uh, you build the confidence and uh, make the structures more sustainable for the long term. Uh, and uh, as my colleague Pishkafti mentioned, uh, in one of the location, we build the capacity of uh, our local partners so that when it comes to issues regarding protection of children or the recruitment or other issues, they have they can get the ability and the capacity to locally reach out to the commanders and uh, and to see that these issues can be addressed locally in the long term basis. Uh, but at the same time, last year I would like to say that uh, when it comes to access negotiation, it's not only for protection but also for assistance. And uh, at the same time, it can also lead towards uh, long-term dialogue because uh, armed actors sometimes, or most of the time, are a reality when they are located in certain locations. It's not just one time that you negotiate it and it's done. It's a continuous process that lasts even for six months to three years because uh, bringing some group of people back to their areas is one thing, but to ensure that this group of people continue to stay there is the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, these are such fantastic examples of practical ways that uh, long-term sustained and continuous engagement with groups, as well as with civilian communities uh, on the ground, um, ensures that protection of civilians is, uh, is an overall process. So next, I'd like to turn to Musa. And for those of you who might have just joined, um, Musa will be speaking in French. So there is translation available. If you want to click on the button down below, um, you can click on English translation or whatever language um, is best for you. So Musa, uh, Geneva Call has recently published uh, this past June, a study on humanitarian access in the Sahel. So could you share with us the main takeaways for protection uh, access for protection activities, as well as any recommendations that you have on how to address the challenges associated with access for protection activities. Uh, thank you very much. So, 
I'll be starting by uh, talking about the study uh, carried out in Mars 2022, and most notably in Burkina Faso in Niger. And the study is called and um, state um, actors and non-state actors and the opportunities in the Sahel region for humanitarian actions. So knowing that in Sahel, we have what we call radical groups. So in my presentation, I'll be talking about uh, what the outcomes are in terms of perception, the perception, the way the armed groups see the humanitarian uh, stakeholders. And this, I will give you the, the big lines, the big uh, principles, the main outcomes. And I also want to talk about the specific way they see uh, our activities. And I will conclude by some recommendations. So the name, the, so we had interviews, we have armed groups, we have uh, meetings with um, these armed groups, and we have focus groups. So in terms of perception, the first point, the first thing we noticed is that except for the reconciliation, the uh, signatories of the reconciliation agreement and those who signed these groups, well, these groups said they had they have a good uh, view on our activities, humanitarian activities. It means because they as a signed the the uh, the peace agreement, so they kind of they famous, they have well known and they well organized, and they so they have a more a more political approach. And it's also important for them to pay attention to uh, human rights. So all these groups. So we, all the groups will be able to talk to, and that includes the people, the, the groups who signed this, uh, this um, peace agreement. And I would say that uh, the other groups don't have such a, a positive uh, approach to our activities. I wouldn't say it's a negative approach, but uh, so what are this is, uh, why don't they trust us? Because they had doubts about uh, how we can uh, stay neutral. So, this concept, I'm not sure you can see me because it's my, uh, I'm not sure you can see me or you can hear me. Musa, we, well? we can hear you, but because your connection is a little unstable, we're going to keep your video off so that we can hear you really well, okay? okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you. That was just to, to, to make sure that you could hear me. So they have a bad uh, perception of what we do because they had doubts. They had doubts about how uh, our neutrality and how we can be impartial, how the humanitarian actors can be, uh, can stay neutral. It's more uh, obvious in Burkina Faso and and these uh, distrust are based on the, the because they don't understand whether our approaches and our methods for some of them they are they are in municipalities and villages they see us coming they give the assistance food materials and they don't really understand how we've decided who are the beneficiaries and and so they get a feeling that there was no way to, to, to define the, the correct beneficiaries, the people who are truly in need. So this concept of targeting the right beneficiaries, and this uh, creates some distrust among our uh, these uh, armed groups. And another thing that may be problematic, so we have a radical groups and what we call a self-defense groups, and they don't understand how the uh, the humanitarian actors have access to uh, areas controlled by radical groups. They can't go there, but the humanitarian actors they can go there. So they have this distrust, and they they are they tell it frankly that they may be that these uh, the humanitarian actors have some um, some secret agreement with the uh, the most radical groups and this is why they allowed to go in these areas and these are the three main um, points we've been able to identify and uh, as stated by these uh, groups the 
highlighted the, the importance of these uh, protection activities and most notably the follow-up on protection activities. These self-defense groups, how they are called themselves, they, this looks a bit like intelligence because for them, uh, because we have the protection committees and they, they, they're collecting data, they're collecting info, incidents which took place in the area and they share the area so to manage the uh, their activities and these groups said we don't know how these humanitarian actors use this data this info so the follow-up on this data and the uh, whistleblowing systems after this in order to collect the data there's a complete distrust and they consider it to be pretty much almost like um, intelligence agency and so moving on to the uh, activities therefore violent uh, gender-based violence and most notably the, uh, the the help we bring to women they tend to to think that they want us to change the the society but when we have these uh, new ngos who are focused exclusively on women and they only talk to women well for these radical groups they are disappointed they don't be disappointed and maybe deceived they don't really understand the the purpose of all this so the consequences are that it's uh, they make the access to some NGOs more difficult for example notably with they have checkpoints they put checkpoints on the roads uh, and most of the time the uh, is uh, very difficult to go through these checkpoints. It's not enough to, to come there and say, uh, I want to, to go through. So they also have uh, uh, taxes. They, they call it the price of tea. That's the name of the tax. Or oh, the price of uh, chicken, it most notably in Burkina Faso. They make things much more difficult. For based on the community who needs our help. So let's not forget that the self-defense um, groups are based on communities, on uh, ethnicities. So if they know that this help, this assistance is for a specific community, we don't like. Well, they may make things more difficult for us and more make us more difficult for us to, to bring this assistance to this community. And sometimes we they tend to f also to focus on the ethnicity or the community of the of the staff members if for example if my member belongs to a, a community they makes could make things more difficult for them so and uh, for my recommendations i think that we need to raise awareness and we need to inform people so we can uh, focus on and train these uh, armed groups because uh, we know that they have doubts, suspicions and because they don't have the correct awareness on what we do. And the second element is that we need to uh, strengthen the cooperation among the uh, humanitarian stakeholders so they can uh, convey the same message to these armed groups so they can understand the, our constraints. And the very last point, I think it would be important to to bring a new dynamics and to strengthen the uh, the community-based uh, mechanisms for protection. And this is why we highlighted a strong potential to get access to humanitarian assistance uh, while uh, relying our efforts on the uh, community leaders. So we need to work with the community leaders. We need to count on their complete involvement and concrete involvement in our humanitarian activities so we can have a, an easier access. And this is I wanted to share with you and thank you. Thanks so much, Musa. And for those of you who are asking in the chat about the report uh, link, I've put it uh, once again, Rania from OHCHR has also put it in there, but uh, the link is in the chat if you'd like to take a closer look. Musa, if I can ask you um, just a, a follow-up question or two, how do you see the role played by local communities or civil society organizations in such access negotiations? And how can local capacities be better integrated into access negotiations? 
It's a very good question. So the custom leaders have a huge role in Sahel. They have a really big role to play, not only on social activities, but also politically. I will talk about the last events in Burkina Faso. There is a, a political crisis, and in the end, it's political and religious leaders who manage to calm the tensions and to uh, make sure that no one used weapons. So in the same way, when there is a disaster, leaders of communities are the first ones to bring an answer. So, so thanks to this first rank role, humanitarian actors must use this role and to try to involve them in negotiations. Let's not forget that all armed groups have uh, moral references with their leaders so they can be influenced by leaders. So we need to identify these people. I will finish by saying that local resources, custom leaders. It's true that the Sahel is going through a crisis, but traditional mechanisms and local mechanisms exist. So humanitarian actors, no matter the field, need to use these resources. Merci. Great, thank you so much, Moussa. Um, and so I'm starting to get some questions in the chat box. Again, if you would like to ask uh, questions to any of our panelists as we go along, please do put um, those questions in the chat. I'll keep track of them and uh, we'll have some time at the end uh, to go back to our speakers. And uh, next I would like to turn to Aaron. And um, Aaron, from your perspective in working on these issues in Yemen with the NRC, how do you see the linkages between improved access to essential services but, uh, for the civilian population and increased protection, for example, in terms of creating an enabling environment that reduces the need for humanitarian assistance through protection of infrastructure, local economies and livelihoods, for example? This is a really interesting question and, and one that's rather relevant to the context in which we work here in Yemen. Uh, we're working within a context where the access constraints, both the access of civilian populations to essential services and protection, and that of humanitarians to the civilian population are particularly onerous. In particular, when we speak of humanitarian response in Yemen, due to a number of different factors, the humanitarian response is also de facto replacing a development response, as well as in many cases, like basic service provision that would usually be provided by the state. Um, and just a quick note for those less familiar with Yemen, we're working in a context where we have two different sets of authorities, um, the de facto authorities uh, or DFA in the north of the country, as well as the internationally recognized government or the IRG in the south of the country, um, both of whom, along with the Saudi-led coalition are parties to the conflict. Um, while all parties to the conflict are perpetrators of violence against civilian populations, um, much of what I'll speak to today and, and much of what I speak to today is, is very relevant countrywide, I will give a particular focus to areas under control of the de facto authorities given the, the focus of the, the discussion today. Due to the nature of access reporting in Yemen, we necessarily have a much better understanding of our challenges as humanitarian actors to reach populations and less understanding of how access to services is constrained for people in need. There's some huge gaps due to inaccessibility to certain areas. For example, certain hard to reach frontline locations where data is simply unavailable to us as there's little or no humanitarian presence and so we don't have a proper overview of how people are accessing services or not. As well, constraints on humanitarian actors access to communities through restrictions of assessments and on feedback mechanisms, particularly by Ansarala, the de facto authorities, also constrains our understandings of coping mechanisms and reliance on aid. Um, and a lack of feedback mechanisms particularly presents a huge constraints to uh, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse reporting and referrals for other protection services. 
building a safer environment for Yemenis through protection of infrastructure, local economies, and livelihoods needs to go hand in hand with humanitarian leadership, pushing on commitments for the protection of populations, increasing access to humanitarian of humanitarian actors to better understand the protection needs, and supporting communities in terms of civilian self-protection mechanisms. Ensuring that essential services are functioning and accessible to people in, the, uh, in need in Yemen is extremely important for protection outcomes um, as it reduces reliance on aid and decreases negative coping mechanisms. This is particularly important in a protracted crisis like Yemen where funding is continuing to decrease every year. However, there's a, quite a number of dilemmas that humanitarian actors face when trying to create this type of enabling environment particularly when we're working in areas controlled by armed groups or de facto authorities. In Yemen, services and infrastructure have been damaged and constrained by years of war. Authorities are unable to pay salaries for many key roles, including for teachers and health workers. Uh, rather than the humanitarian response having a parallel system, INGOs and UN agencies are currently paying incentives to existing public sector workers to keep part of, parts of the system from, from failing. And fortunately, this also presents its own dilemmas um, and interference by authorities in the North um, in terms of the, the types of activities that you can do, demands for taxation on these uh, incentives for public sector workers is creating a lot of difficulties for humanitarians in this area. There's ethical questions for us that we must continue to critically analyze when it comes to supporting state institutions, particularly when we know that, that a large proportion of centrally held money may be used by, um, by the de facto authorities for conflict related or military activities. Ensuring that authorities view incentives for workers supporting local services as part of humanitarian work and not as taxable income is key to the continuation of these types of services. Attempts by authorities, particularly in the North, to control and extract financial benefit from projects aimed at strengthening infrastructure, the economy, or livelihoods also presents a challenge for humanitarian actors when dealing with armed groups, and they constrain the benefits of these projects for communities. This often takes the form of control over, for example, which suppliers are contracted for construction projects, increasing taxation on suppliers, uh, interference in who receives assistance through, through controlling beneficiary lists, and sometimes as well extortion of beneficiaries um, uh, who have access to, to beneficiary lists. For projects to meaningfully contribute to enhance protection of populations by aiming to create a stable enabling environment, it's critical to reduce the level of interference by authorities through strong common positioning, red lines, standards, led by humanitarian leadership with accountability through the HCT and clusters. A particularly critical challenge the humanitarian community faces is, is often in deciding between whether to when to and how to directly address violence from parties to the conflict and how we balance this with the impact it can have on an organization's wider access to provide assistance to populations in need. Of course, we also recognize that when one, what one organization does has an impact on the entire humanitarian community as well. So we're not just making decisions for ourselves, but for the wider uh, humanitarian community. We're working within a context where parties to the conflict are inherently suspicious of humanitarian activities. Their entire approach is from a military security lens, and very often they assume humanitarian activities must have some type of underlying security or intelligence rationale. For example, the de facto authorities view assessments as an opportunity for intelligence gathering, uh, for information that will pass on to other parties, and therefore there's, there's a, uh, very strict restrictions placed on our ability to conduct assessments. Protection and inclusion assessments can be particularly sensitive. For example, as humanitarians, we want to ensure that our programming is inclusive and accessible, and therefore we need to understand vulnerabilities related to disability, for example. However, authorities may assume that when we're collecting this type of information, we're doing it because we want to gather information on the idea, on the areas in which fighters are actually coming from so that we can pass this information on to other parties to the conflict. 
All parties to the conflict in Yemen are perpetrators of violence against civilians, and they are the ones who control our access. Um, an example of this is that there's many organizations who are working in education, who may sometimes turn a bit of a blind eye to uh, the quote unquote summer camps that may be used as recruiting mechanisms for youth as fighters in Yemen. Uh, similarly, organizations are hesitant to report on grave violations against children, um, because deciding to directly address these issues of parties to the conflict would absolutely have direct, uh, direct negative impacts on an organization's access, because it will put organizations um, at, at odds with the authorities who control every step of our access to, to providing assistance. I've spoken quite a bit about the dilemmas we face and less about what we can do to negotiate our access. Um, when I was reflecting on what the humanitarian community needs to do in order to properly address this, um, I keep coming back to the need for really courageous leadership that puts protection at the center of the response. In this context, the role of the humanitarian leadership, including the HC, the DHC, and OCHA, is really critical. While their role is, of course, important in every response, I cannot underscore the role that they must play in contexts like Yemen, where here, each individual organization is constantly pulled between this tension that I described and being honest, often decision-making falls on the side of maintaining our wider access to provide assistance. Authorities who are priced to the conflict control our access every single step. And um, I can say as somebody, as a country director who faces this dilemma on a daily basis, I, I can admit that um, I have definitely made those same decisions, and I know just how difficult this type of decision making can be. However, as a humanitarian community, together we do have significant leverage over, um, over the parties. A joint approach where agencies have agreed to a common understanding of red lines, joint operating principles, as well as mechanisms to actually mobilize action would be a first step in this direction. Um, as individual organizations, we face retaliation when we push sensitive issues too far with authorities, uh, which can include suspension, denials of visas, which some of uh, our colleagues on the call today can attest to personally, uh, slower approval of projects, travel permits, et cetera. Um, the leadership in OCHA are really essential in being the face of these issues because they don't have operations that can be held hostage. A well-resourced coordination system with the right people in the right place is the number one thing I can recommend. Um, there's also a key role here for the protection cluster or also specialist protection advisors, such as ProCAPs, who can play a role in supporting the leadership in this, even in cases where leadership may have willingness to put protection at the center of the response, they may need support in how to do this in practice. Um, and, and finally, while communities and civil society have their own mechanisms to negotiate their own access, I think that there are two key elements not to overlook here. Um, first, in I think I want to highlight that in, in highly militarized contexts, the space for people to do so without causing further protection risks to themselves, to their families, to their communities may be constrained. And specific support from the international community may be important in contexts like this. As well, I think often we as an international community are not even aware of how to best provide su support to these types of efforts. And we do need to invest more time and capacity to better understand this so that our efforts are complementary. And at, you know, um, at a minimum that our efforts to increase our own access are not putting communities further at risk. Um, as part of this, one of the roles we can play is increasing the knowledge of populations on legal rights to identity, accessing legal documentation, um, as well as accessing to, uh, which is really key to accessing essential services. Without this, it's impossible for people in need to facilitate their own access to existing services. Um, in the current context in Yemen, building this type of sustained enabling environment for protection is challenging. Um, the recent failure of the UN brokered truce is a blow to efforts to secure a long lasting peace for Yemen. Um, a long lasting peace agreement is crucial to creating this type of ena enabling environment. However, even in the absence of this, there are still very specific and concerted steps that we as a humanitarian community can do both to improve our own ability 
to provide assistance and protection services, as well as to support the community's ability to access these services on their own. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erin. And if I could maybe just ask a, a quick follow-up question. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more, you, you described some of the challenges in um, getting maybe necessarily access or involving um, marginalized communities or communities that are not as visible um, or that might not have trust uh, in international actors, um, to getting them access to services. But I know obviously um, making sure that they are uh, involved in the design and, and identification of needs of your programs is really important. So could you talk a little bit more about how you do um, engage these communities, whether it's people with disabilities or um, individuals who may have suffered or survived uh, sexual and gender-based violence? Um, how are you able to get their views and perspectives in the design and implementation of these pro projects on the ground when it is a complex and challenging uh, set of circumstances and, and there is a lack of trust in either government run facilities or even facilities run by humanitarian actors? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a number of specific bureaucratic impediments that are put in place to prevent us from being able to build really strong, close relationships at community level. Um, however, I think that for organizations like NRC and many other NGOs, uh, we have had a sustained presence for many years in specific areas and being able to maintain that presence and build trust of community level, uh, community members really at the ground level is one of the most important things. Um, while there are a lot of challenges for us to be able to get access to communities, once we're there, we can build those trusting relationships and then be able to understand their needs through our day-to-day -day conversations, through um, a back and forth mechanism, even if in places, for example, a formal feedback mechanism may have certain challenges to it. So really that sustained day-to-day -day presence on the ground through trusted staff is really important. Um, and one of the things that we've found quite uh, important uh, as well is making sure that our frontline staff have the tools they need to be able to understand the different vulnerabilities of the groups that we're, that we're working with. And then that those frontline staff have channels to feed that back up to management and the, the expert staff who will design proposals, et cetera, so that our staff on the ground who are, have such rich information, who have such a local level knowledge, um, that information doesn't just stay with them, which when you're very busy in a huge emergency response like Yemen, sometimes is a, is a side effect of everybody just being overwhelmed with the amount of work. But how do you create those channels so that that, that information really can come up to management is really essential. Absolutely. And I think we're, we're hearing that theme over and over again. It's, it's long-term, sustained, consistent um, communication and relationship building, not only with the armed groups, but with the government, with local communities, to make sure that everybody understands the norms and principles of humanitarian assistance projects, which is that we are neutral, impartial, and independent actors providing needs to um, ensure the protection of civilians. So thank you, Erin. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Samuel. And uh, Samuel, if uh, we know that the uh, issue of protection is clearly a priority for the government of the United Kingdom, and you and I have had some uh, in-depth conversations about the impact of humanitarian access for civilian population. So could you offer some reflections from a state perspective on access for protection activities in relation to the engagement of armed groups? Yeah, thanks, uh, Christy. Hope hope people are hearing me um, okay. So, see, so yeah, in terms of um, of the member state, or also, I, I suppose, as a as, as a donor, um, the FCDO as well, can can share a few um, a few thoughts um, on engagement with non-state armed groups. I mean. I think that actual direct engagement is 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 by and large really um, the preserve of our, our partners. So so NRC and, and Geneva Call and, and, and many uh, others um, on the line. It's it's really an ever more important one, and I think it's one of the big drivers of why we're 
we're looking again really at our whole approach to humanitarian access. I mean, the, the often quoted IRS, ICRC number, I think, is um, or has 614 uh, armed groups of concerns to their operations around the world in, in 2020. So, you know, that's a number that's really only in, increased um, as conflicts are becoming even, even more fractured. So I think, you know, really uh, as a state supporting um, humanitarian partners, it's, um, it's obviously a, a significant concern for us. I think really good to to hear, therefore, the um, uh, the work that's being done. How this is coming on is more of a uh, a discipline in itself, really, um, and and the insights from um, from colleagues in Iraq, uh, in in the Sahel, and and, and Yemen, um, who are actually right on on the front lines of these um, of these negotiations and engagement to 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 get access and and improve protection. I mean, j just maybe to sort of go back a little bit to the overall uh, theme of this this forum, I, I think it's, you know, it's all too often forgotten um, that, you know, maybe not amongst those those here, but, but certainly I think in, in the international community that uh, humanitarian access isn't just about getting trucks in um, across lines to deliver relief uh, in a conflict and, and, and then back, but it's you know, it's those affected people's access to services um, as well. And we've just been uh, we've just been hearing that from um, from Erin and others. You know, so you know, access for uh, a mother to get her her child to a malnutrition clinic, say. But then on on the sort of protection side, beyond that, I think the process of of negotiating access itself can be. Uh, can be really, really critical as an opportunity to raise awareness of um, uh, legal obligations uh, of humanitarian principles, understanding of the way in which uh, organizations work, and therefore uh, building that, that trust and acceptance. And that, that's a theme that, that I think the, the word trust came up a number of times, and I think it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite hard won. And actually, there's a lot of uh, suspicion in these these situations and contested spaces so you know that's something that that, that, that needs to have a real uh, sustained effort and then i think really you know access and and protection are often really indivisible so uh you know if we're talking about um people's access to water infrastructure uh that's also about the you know the protection of of the right to access that service and the protection of uh, the the water infrastructure itself. So it's you know in in international humanitarian law, it's a, uh, an object in, indispensable to the survival of the the civilian population. So I think you know really treating these uh, as, as two separate is 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 a bit problematic. Then. You know, we've got uh, in, in, in the SCDO at the moment, and I think the UK has over time had a strong focus on, on gender and women and girls. In these situations, you know, we know women and girls are disproportionately uh, impacted by um, crises because of inequalities, uh, the increased levels of, of violence we see, be it, be it intimate partner or, or conflict related. And then the, the increased barriers to ac access essential services and, and humanitarian assistance. So really quite interesting, I think the, um, one of the earlier speakers talking about how, how some of the approaches we come with in terms of gender can also um, present a challenge and something that has to be worked through in terms of the engagement with, with non-state armed groups and, and, and building that trust. So I think that, you know, it's, um, it's perhaps even even more so than just traditional you know access negotiations for uh, assistance but but when we're thinking particular activities um, around gender around um, minority or, or vulnerable groups that um, those sort of sensitivities are, are taken into account and understood as part of the the wider approach to um, to negotiating access for an operational agency or, or, or for the people affected. Um, so, so, yeah, I, th I think as, as member states and donors, it's really important that, that not only access, but protection and or access that 
that protects are really at the heart of our, our narrative on what humanitarian action is. Um, so it's great to be to be joining up with with like-minded organisations on this, and Geneva Call, the Global Protection Cluster, um, NRC, and others all working on this. In terms of how to sort of improve our work here, I think um, there is a need to to continue that effort to strengthen the capacity of the the humanitarian system in this. Um, it was mentioned also earlier around you know local staff, uh, local partners. So that really needs to be part of the the thinking on capacity strengthening. Um, so that at that sort of local tactical level. Uh, you know, we have um, a more structured approach and, and expertise um, to undertake those negotiations to deliver protection outcomes. And I think this really means, you know, learning from some of the specialist organisations so that, that have been working particularly on this, so Geneva Core, but also uh, the ICRC, um, maybe thinking outside the humanitarian sector as well. I mean, so from, from the mediation community who are engaging these groups perhaps for different purposes, but, but how can we, we learn from some of that um, and how we can draw, draw insights from how communities and, and affected people locally um, engage. So in terms of really sort of trying to strengthen that, that learning and, and what we've been uh, doing and supporting, um, we've supported some work with the Graduate Institute of Geneva and Geneva Call, looking to really distill the evidence um, on non-state armed groups' understanding and interpretation um, of international humanitarian law, international human rights law. So including in, in uh, Iraq and, and the Sahel, some of the examples. We're also uh, working with GPPI uh, and Geneva Call. Um, here to, to look at how we can encourage armed groups to comply with norms um, and assessing the effectiveness of, of different modes and different ways of engaging. So I think we heard some really interesting lessons here, but how can we, uh, you know, how can we build a strong evidence base uh, on this so we can take um, decisions uh, across context? That's going to be quite, uh, some of this is going to be quite locally specific, um, but as much as possible, how can we, you know, how can we build the evidence base and make the case to do more of this to support it and show that it can really deliver protection outcomes. Um, and then alongside support to individual agencies, um, I think there's also a need for some sort of common services that, that can support uh, engagement with uh, non-state armed groups. Uh, and Erin talked about the, the role of OCHA, the leadership. Um, I think that's, a, that's an important element. And it's great to see that OCHA has, a, at the moment, really a, a renewed interest uh, and engagement on access, which, uh, which has always been there, I think, in, in, in their mandate from the General Assembly, but has had sort of varying engagement over time. So it's excellent to to see some of that. And I think you know, some of the ideas that are being talked about in terms of, of mapping of, of different groups, including across borders, um, supporting where it's appropriate, uh, collective engagement or, or positioning. I think that it, it won't always, we won't always want it to be uh, collective and, it, and you know, it might be the individual organizations at, at the local level, but where that can add value. And then at the, at the operational level, the humanitarian country teams, um, I think, have, have a really important role in terms of shaping that wider uh, operational environment and setting the context for how um, others are engaging. Um, so, so that's an important part. Uh, and we're looking at how we can, we can build on some of the support we've previously provided to the rollout of, of HCT protection strategies um, to look more at, uh, be it collective um, advocacy by the humanitarian sort of leadership in, in country or more private engagement on a select uh, sort of smaller number of, of um, so two to three top issues um, and how we can really drive um, some of that forward given that, that um, they face maybe different uh, exposure to those that are really on, on the front lines. Um, and then, and then at the sort of higher level, the more sort of strategic level, um, there's a few things uh, we can do. I think the UK's uh, played quite an important role in trying to protect some of the normative environment for for this work, including at the, the Security Council, 
Um, and we've last year co-chaired the group of friends on uh, conflict and hunger uh, resolution 2417 at the council, really trying to improve reporting and accountability for, for some of these related violations of, of IHL. And we're trying to step up our work uh, at the moment really to address um, some of the barriers to humanitarian access uh, and protection that might unintentionally be created uh, by sanctions, um, counterterrorism, other national security measures to, to ensure that this, this important work can, can actually take place. So um, building on the success of the uh, resolution uh, exempting um, humanitarian action from sanctions in uh, Afghanistan, there's now a, a, an opportunity at the Council really to look uh, how we do this uh, much more widely across uh, all regimes, which could could be a really uh, an important factor in, in enabling um, some of this work. And I think it's only through sort of working right across these uh, these levels. So from what we've heard right at the um, sort of the front line of, of engagement, the coalface, if you like, right up to to the level of the Security Council and so on, um, and the role of states like the the UK. Then I think we can we can enable a, a better dialogue. Um, stronger negotiations and, and ultimately uh, improve protection outcomes uh, through through this engagement for for affected people. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but back to you, uh, Christy. Great, thank you. I think what, you, what you've touched on here too is, you know, the importance of effective coordination between the global level, looking at the triple nexus between humanitarian development and the peace building communities is really key as well as you know, thinking outside the box um, at the local level as well and thinking about how to best engage local actors, local communities, um, who are, of course, experts um, in their own needs and, and how to best provide those um, to their own communities. Um, I think this is really important. And, you know, we're, we're all very excited about um, the upcoming uh, PSVI conference in the UK, um, where I know that uh, the topic of preventing sexual violence is, is going to be a major topic of conversation, especially in the humanitarian communities and, and thinking about not only the ways that, that governments um, can be effective in uh, addressing these challenges, um, both from a donor perspective as well as political perspectives, um, as well as you know, how to engage the voices and, and actors on the ground um, who are Ah, I've been talking and I've muted myself, apologies. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure where I left off, but um, just to say we're, we're very excited about uh, the, um, the upcoming PSVI uh, conference in the UK. Oh, okay, you heard everything uh, except last year. All right, not sure how I got muted because it wasn't me and my hands are, you know, talking on my face. <laughs> but uh, yes, we're, we're very excited to, to have um, the, the conversations um, from, from government political actors as well as local community activists and survivors themselves. So um, I have a number of questions from, uh, from the audience that I've been carefully collecting. And um, Musa, the first question was actually to you, and it was specifically regarding some of the, um, the gender issues within the study. And um, so we've got a question here asking, is the gender analysis and related, uh, related to the GBV facts that you mentioned present at the level of the report or, and is it integrated in the response or recommendations? Actually, do we still have Musa on? Because his video has been off, so. Um, he is still in the room, but his connection wasn't great. Okay. Well, maybe I will come back to him. And um, well, there's Sam, there was another question specifically to you. So maybe I'll come to you real quick just because your uh, comments are fresh in our minds and then we'll, we'll come back to Musa if he's able to connect. Uh, so Sam, the question uh, we had here was, how do donors ensure that their funding requirements don't create disincentives to negotiations for protection outcomes? We know that many donors incentivize beneficiaries reached, activities undertaken, which can translate to humanitarian institutional priorities of access, whatever the cost. Um, and so how do donors support course correction to mitigate such practices? 
And I think this actually goes back to maybe a previous conversation you and I have had about, you know, what is impact? How do we measure it and how do we make sure that it's achieved? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so, I mean, there, there is a risk, I think, that we dis disincentivize some of this engagement in a number of ways. Um, you know, we, you know, donors need to manage um, or they need to account to uh, particularly sort of public donors for the for the money that's that's being spent, um, and you know that, that there's a kind of uh, a range of kind of measures that are put in place to manage fiduciary risk that you know the money isn't spent uh, appropriately, um, and then I think there's the you know, whole range of kind of compliance with. Um, with sanctions, counterterrorism, and so on, other measures, which I think all come from a, a, a good place, uh, and I think they're important um, for for states like the UK. I think, in terms of sort of, so you know, if you look at a country like uh, Somalia, say, uh, and, and questions about access, the the panel of experts, their their last report. Um, has some sort of anecdotal points around how some of these these measures may have sort of um, disincentivized or prevented access, but it's quite hard to disentangle what actually had the the impact. So I think we need to be, get better at understanding that. But actually, it's a bit of a snowball when you can exempt some uh, uh, um, uh, countries and areas from you know if you if you can roll back certain you know uh, exempt certain UN sanctions and different member states do the same uh, and it becomes a bit of a snowball and you actually sort of uh, yeah can, can really address some of this quite effectively so I think that's kind of uh, the baseline we've kind of making some quite good progress let's see where we get to uh, at Security Council by the end of the year but I, I think there's uh, a really good direction of travel and, and strong US leadership on that, that that we didn't necessarily have previously. And then, I mean, I, I think it's uh, in, in terms of kind of, yeah, exactly as you said, Christy, how do we incentivize this? It's about demonstrating uh, impact. So we've got a program at the, um, at the moment really trying to invest in evidence and what works on, on certain elements of, of protection and um, some of the work with Geneva Call is, is part of this. Um, humanitarian action has really poor evidence base overall, but often it's the areas that were weakest and most challenged, like cash transfers, that had to build up that evidence, and now we actually support quite quite well. So I think if we could do that more on protection, that would be that would be good. Uh, and then finally, I think it's really about that there's a there's a close partnership um, at the at the local level, and some of these decisions are really difficult. Uh, you know, in northern Ethiopia, what what is the, the you know when do you say well we can't assess certain populations uh, and we can't deliver protection services? Uh, you know that that we shouldn't uh, assist populations at all, or we should even consider a temporary suspension. I mean that's quite a uh, a difficult question. I think that'll be for uh, individual partners to work through. Um, but certainly, you know, given the gravity of some of these situations, we would still want to continue to be providing life-saving assistance. Um, but yeah, so so a few points there, but but they are tricky tricky questions to 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 work through. Absolutely, thank you. Looks like we've got Musa back. So Musa, I'll repeat the question for you. Um, and for the audience, um, is the gender analysis and related uh, related to the GBV facts that you mentioned in your remarks present at the level of the report, and is it integrated in the response and recommendations? So I understood. I understood. I understand. I'm not sure I understood. I understand. I understood the, the question very well, but I know you were talking, talking about the gender based violence, didn't you? Yes. So, Can you hear me well? Um, okay. Yes. So, uh, were there any, um, perhaps, more details related to the uh, the issues of GBV in the report uh, that you mentioned? And we've got the link in the chat box too. So, if folks want to go and, and take a look, they can read it. So, unfortunately, I'm not sure I understood the question, but if it's about the GBV and how they are integrated in our actions, well, in Sahel, yes, okay, right. 
So we have um, eight topics, and the so GBV is a cross-cutting uh, topic for all our interventions. When we come to a country, we try to have uh, discussions and negotiations with the conflicting parties, but also the local communities in order to define the most relevant topics we can discuss with the armed uh, groups. So when we do this, when we have the, the, the we define the GBV as a very specific topic, we tend to see that the populations tend to to give up and to, to forget that we have to talk about the GBV because they're facing a very difficult crisis with a lot of atrocities everywhere. So it means that the GBV GBV will tend to forget uh, to talk about this. So in order to for, to to not do so, we try when we talk about the the children, uh, the prevention. Uh, protection of families. So we try to add this cross-cutting topic of GBV. And this is why we have an inclusive message. We try to include it in our discussions. So on the other... So in Burkina, Burkina Faso, we work in, with a local organization uh, led by women, and this organization has been working for many years. So in order to, to fight for the rights of women, and we've been working with this organization for uh, quite a long time in order to integrate this uh, uh, the international law and the humanitarian law in what we do and they try to raise awareness among women and to to mobilize women so they can make their voices heard and by and to make sure that these uh, these uh, these people this women can actually uh, play their role their part in the society so now these the uh, s characteristics of our recommendations is that some actors they tend to try to only prioritize women so we understand that the the best will be to improve uh, the, 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 the life of uh, women and girls, but it should be accepted. It must be accepted by uh, community leaders, but we need to count and rely on the support of men and the full commitment of women, of men. So we need to find a way to, in order to, um, to work with men and not to we shouldn't let men think that it's a conspiracy of uh, the international NGOs. And this is what we wanted to highlight in our recommendations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Musa. That was actually a much more detailed answer than we, we were hoping for. So that's perfect. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that are somewhat related. So maybe I'll ask them together and then open it up to whomever wants to respond from our panel. Um, first, how do we work around community leaders' affiliations to armed groups in context where armed groups are community or ethnic based? And also, how do you best deal with armed actors about the human rights or humanitarian violations they commit without damaging um, the level of trust that you've built with them over a long period of time. So yeah, for the second question, uh, we have the experience that uh, it's good to establish focal points, as I mentioned earlier, within each arm group and uh, to have uh, proper uh, trainings for them on uh, humanitarian principles and human rights. So it's not like just one training. It's, to, it's a kind of accompaniment procedure for the focal points. So they better understand uh, what are those uh, principles and uh, good to establish a group of focal points. They can uh, communicate, they can understand each other. And when such kind of violations happens, then these focal points could be the mediums that such violations can be communicated to them. We tried this, tried this kind of uh, procedure and it works very well. Great. Um, Aaron or Musa, did you want to jump in on anything? Sorry, I, my sound went out for just a second when you were asking the question, so I actually missed the, the sure. question. Apologies. I'll repeat it, because uh, that was actually two questions sort of combined. Um, how do we work around community leaders' affiliations to armed groups in contexts where the armed groups are community or ethnically based? And how do you best deal with armed actors around the human rights or humanitarian violations that they commit without damaging the building of trust uh, that you've established over your, your relationships with them? 
Yeah, and maybe quickly to touch on the second one, I would say with great difficulty. Um, and I think that's, that is um, a bit what I spoke about earlier, this dilemma between how do you remain principled as an organization and recognize how essential it is to really put the protection of, of um, civilian populations at the center of our work, while also recognizing that in, in situations where the armed groups or the de facto authorities or other parties to the conflict can have such strong control over our access, that some, by speaking out or confronting them on certain issues, that actually um, can damage your long-term ability to have a positive impact. And so what I would say there is, I don't think for us at least, there's necessarily one you know, black or white answer, but it is about weighing up your short, what it is you're looking for, you know, um, not just your short-term access or your short-term outcome, but long-term, what is it that we as an organization want to achieve? What's the impact we want to have? for the people we're trying to serve and not for us as an organization. And I think coming back to maybe a question that Samuel answered earlier was that I think is, is often what's difficult is making those decisions based on what's best for the people we're trying to serve and not necessarily what's best for us as an organization because sometimes they're aligned and sometimes they're different. Um, and I think on the first question, um, again, I don't think there's necessarily, you know, one silver bullet as there's no silver bullets when you're talking about access ever. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of efforts. Um, but I think for us, it's really about remaining principled and remaining really neutral and needs based and coming back to that and really being able to ensure that all of your staff at all levels are able to articulate not only what are the humanitarian principles, but why. Um, and maybe an example of this is I first landed in Yemen in, you know, in 2015, um, in the in the early days of the, the conflict here. And uh, you know, as country director, I was talking about humanitarian principles and you know, a principle response. And that might mean, you know, in this area, we were having to suspend our programming for a certain amount of time because we needed to be able to independently access communities and not just be handed a list by a party to the conflict and, and work based on that. And after a couple of months, I had, you know, I was on field visit in Hodeida and one of my, my colleagues came to me and kind of shyly said, I don't really understand why we're just standing on principle here. People are in need, but but we're just suspending just because of the principle. And it, it it was kind of a light bulb for me that we that I had made an assumption that people understood why we were doing this. And and I think that's really important for humanitarian leadership to understand is it 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 really needs to be every person at every level of the organization, not just understanding what the humanitarian principles are, why we work on a neutral needs basis, but being able to actually articulate that so that in their work and in discussing their negotiations with armed groups, with de facto authorities, others, with community leaders themselves, they can well articulate that so that we're not breaking that trust there. Thanks. Absolutely. I think one of the, the best things about um, the the model that our, our field colleagues at Geneva Call use is, is truly that whether they're engaging with community leaders, ethnic groups, um, armed actors, de facto authorities, security groups, the, the goal is A, your underlying achievement is are, are civilians being protected um, and do they have access to the humanitarian um, resources that they need, um, but B, in the methodology is it's providing them with a common language based on not only the, the exact language, not just English or French, because that's the language that, that the treaty was written in, but what is the actual language spoken by the communities? What local religious or cultural practices are, are, are their norms? What, how do they interact? What, what is normal for them to engage on? Because everybody has some form of protection uh, principles in whatever community they come from. So being able to use our, our staff on the ground who are from these communities themselves to be able to 
is to, to give them that language so that they can then have a converse, whether the community groups or the armed actors, um, you know, who might not have maybe thought about it in those terms, then have a common language where they can come together to talk about these norms and principles is really, really important. Um, actually, Musa, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Did you want to add anything to this? Uh, oui, je voudrais dire... Yes. I want to answer to the two questions you've asked. Please. The first was linked to how to talk about violations with armed groups without breaching the trust. We need a, a thorough analysis of the group in Sahel, for example. We have a typology. We have the radical group and the other group. So for the self-defense group, we are lucky enough that they all have conduct codes internally and they have limits for fighters. So we need to analyze these conduct codes and to articulate debates and discussions around these conduct codes. So instead of starting from us and going to uh, their code of conduct, we must start from their conduct codes. This way, they don't feel the opposition, they feel valued and it's true that armed groups are not um, saints, but they have ideologies, they have political ideas, economic institutions, but they use uh, force because they think it's the only way that exists to achieve their objectives. So they are humans, we can talk and have frank discussions with them. So that was the first question. For the second question, for the affiliation of uh, community leaders and armed groups, I think we always need analysis and to be maybe at a distance of the group. Sometimes some people in the context are impacted by their own perceptions of the locality. Often we lack an analysis of the influence that exists between the groups and the community leaders. In Burkina Faso, we have, oh, the connection dropped, the interpreter apologizes. I cannot hear Musa anymore. Musa, it seems that the connection might be a bit weak. Um, perhaps if we could turn off your video so that we can hear you. We're trying to turn his video off. I think he might have actually dropped. Okay, well, hopefully we'll get him back. Um, and uh, if there's background noise, I'm in Turkey and so you might hear the call to prayer behind me. So I will um, try to share the next question quickly so that we can get to the answers. Um, in the, just because we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we've we've talked about this a little bit from Samuel's perspective on the donor government side, um, but it would be helpful perhaps for from the field perspective um, if a few of you could talk about um, contexts where governments are fighting armed groups and how do you negotiate protection access to civilians in con, uh, in areas held by armed groups without arousing suspicions or sanctions um, that you are supporting the armed groups or giving the latter some level of recognition or legitimacy? I'm happy to start off on this one as this is a, you know, a perfect question for the Yemen context. Um, we have, you know, an internationally recognized government and we have de facto authorities. I think one of the things that is perhaps a bit particular here is that the de facto authority can um, actually controls um, the, it controls Sana, which was the capital before the IRG and moved the temporary capital to Aden. Um, so they control state institutions. And so we have, dual ministries. We have two ministries of education. We have two ministries of health. We have two central banks, two currencies, et cetera. But this is very a very relevant question for us. And again, I would say with great difficulty and not always successfully. Um, I would say, again, when we do this, um, I think the biggest mistake that organizations have made is often trying to, uh, often prioritizing short-term access gains. Um, at the expense of what does that mean for 
all organizations and the entire community long term. So accepting a constraint on our ability to work in in areas controlled by armed groups just to get that immediate access without realizing what that will mean for the years to come. And I, I think that this is also probably things that our colleagues in Afghanistan are, are grappling with at the moment. Um, I think that in the early years of the response, there's quite a, a, a bit of um, good investment done in explaining the neutrality of the humanitarian response and the needs basis on which we work. Um, and I think that one of the key tools that we have is actually donors and member states. Not all of them, of course, um, are, are good allies on this. But there are a number who recognize the essential role the humanitarian response plays, and they do have close relations both with the internationally recognized government and with this, with um, Gulf countries who have a significant influence over the internationally recognized government. And so, whereas as humanitarian organizations, I may not always be able to be listened to by certain ministers. If I can use our colleagues in, for example, FCDO or in the Norwegian government and their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, the, uh, there's a number of European member states who are fantastic allies for us, and they can pass those messages and they can help safeguard our humanitarian space and our ability to operate effectively throughout the country. They've been excellent, excellent allies for us. Um, and I mean, this is something we're, we're facing at the moment where um, the news that I received today was that, you know, there's a, an imminent uh, announcement by the, the um, IRG's Presidential Leadership Council coming out within days that if we don't move our, our uh, country office, our coordination office, which is currently in Sana, to add them, they'll just stop providing residencies for us, that they will uh, stop our, our operations kind of countrywide uh, for this. So these are the types of things that we have to negotiate on a, on a constant basis. It's about working together, working with member states, and just putting the, the time in. Fantastic. Um... So, uh, Atif or uh, Musa or Peshkafi, is if you uh, have any uh, comments to add, we'd love to hear your thoughts too. No, uh, you should pass. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <laughs> I just very quickly, like uh, Iraq context is different, um, but you know, like there are specific locations uh, which are. Uh, controlled by some uh, outfits, for example, like uh, coordinated by PKK, for example, in areas in Sinjar. Uh, one area, for example, like uh, some of the IDPs, I would say there are thousands who are not allowed to go back into those territories because of their political affiliations with some certain groups. Uh, to coordinate with them, for example, one of the approaches that we're doing as Nima called, we are working with uh, a Joint Operations Command of the Security Forces. Uh, so they are, they are fully in the loop of our activities that we're doing there. And simultaneously, we also work with, the, with that uh, armed outfit in that area. Uh, and uh, we, we offer them a number of trainings, especially on the return-related uh, issues of the, of the IDPs. Uh, and uh, after such trainings, they basically like gradually come to the point that they need to open up having a negotiations uh, with other offices. Uh, so once you bring them uh, on a table to, to, to open up for negotiations, and at the same time keeping other, other sides fully abreast of what is taking place, that could be one of the modus operandi that uh, how, how can you move forward? So in that respect, we are basically currently in process of uh, securing return of the IDPs into that location, where at present this dialogue is going on. So, so this is just one of the examples just I gave um, on the spot. Yeah. All right, and Musa, you've got two minutes for your last thoughts. No, 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 I'll be very short. In fact, it's just... Very brief. Because there are a lot of links between some community leaders and some armed uh, self-defense groups, it's an important resource 
because the nature of some groups means that we cannot have access to some leaders. So I think community leaders are a um, very important resource for that matter. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining our conversation today. It's been incredibly rich and uh, really fantastic to hear so many different regional examples and perspectives um, in very complex environments and situations where um, you might be dealing with self-defense groups, armed actors, de facto authorities, and on many different, uh, different issues. So it's really helpful to hear these different examples given and, and food for thought uh, for those of you who might be encountering similar issues in your own context. Um, and thank you also to, to Samuel for sharing a donor government perspective and your leadership on um, making sure that humanitarian access uh, for, for humanitarian organizations is provided is, is certainly uh, very much welcomed, I'm sure, by everyone in the room today. Um, so thanks so much to, to our panelists for your contributions, to our interpreters for your excellent work um, in, in making sure that all of us can participate in the conversation today. Of course, to our hosts for inviting us to all be uh, here for this discussion. And we hope to engage further on these discussions with you um, in the future. So thank you all so much and have a great morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you might be located and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.